All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I don't want to wait any more longer. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, some of you guys on here I do know. Uh, so that's awesome. Thanks for coming. I am Mike Crater, the District Sales Manager for the Midwest Group uh, for uh, Rhino Carbon Fiber. My territory at this point is pretty robust. So uh, for those of you that are pretty much anywhere from Pennsylvania to South Dakota, uh, you know, down to, uh, we'll say, Tennessee, uh, I would be your guy as far as any questions or orders, uh, application procedures, anything like that. I'd be the guy to help you out. Uh, today's subject matter is going to be CFRP sales and installation. Uh, so CFRP stands for carbon fiber reinforced polymer. Uh, so that's going to refer to uh, pretty much any application that would be uh, a carbon fiber composite uh, or a wet leg or an application for any type of commercial or residential uh, scenario. So what we're going to do uh, we'll run through uh, some of the different products that we offer uh, that fit that category, uh, their installation procedures, uh, and some of the different applications for them. If you guys have any questions throughout, I ask that you guys kind of hold on until the end. I'll open it up uh, to do kind of a Q&A towards the end of the presentation. Uh, there is um, a questions tab there in your kind of control screen that you have uh, through the software. Uh, so if there's something that catches your interest or you have a question, feel free to type it out. I can kind of use that as a bookmark and circle back to it at the end. So for those of you that have been to any of other presentations, we always kind of start out with a little bit of our background. Uh, for those of you that know Luke, you'll probably know this story. Uh, as a young man, he started a company called The Basement Guys here in Central Ohio uh, that quickly grew to be uh, in four states. Uh, over uh, 50 employees and annual sales of over $13 million. Uh, I was along for a part of that ride. Uh, I was the uh, manager for the basement guys for about five years. Uh, so my background is pretty heavy as far as what it's like to be involved in the day-to-day -day applications uh, for the type of companies that install our product. Um, so if you guys ever have questions in, in reference to that, uh, as far as, you know, job management, uh, crew management, anything like that, I can definitely help you out with that as well. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be just referring to our product uh, as far as the assistance that we can give you. Uh, Johnny, who a lot of you guys would know as well, he has a huge uh, commercial background. Uh, so any of uh, the commercial applications that we go through here, if you guys have questions about any of that, how to get into it, uh, kind of the, the concerns or the, the hurdles that you have to jump, he would be your guy for anything for that. So the Basement Guys was founded in 2000. Uh, in 2001, they were an early adopter of uh, carbon fiber or carbon fiber uh, blended product um, that predated my time with the company, uh, but they did create Rhino carbon fiber out of necessity. So there was uh, shortcomings with some of the products that were on the market for uh, reinforcing those walls. Uh, so Luke took it upon himself to develop what is now Rhino Carbon Fiber. Uh, that is obviously a patented system. And then we have other patents as well, uh, specifically on the concrete crack box system, uh, which we'll cover here in a little bit as well. Uh, and at this point, we are part of the AGT products family. Uh, we're one of four brands of theirs. Uh, so it's going to be dry core, barricade, insel armor, and rhino carbon fiber. Uh, so their products, uh, for those of you that are in Canada, you'll probably be pretty familiar with the dry core brand, uh, but it's basically the insulated subfloor panels um, that are kind of a tongue and groove method. Uh, so we're proud to be a part of their company as well. A little bit of background on carbon fiber itself. Uh, it was found by mistake uh, when Edison was developing the light bulb. He discovered it was super strong, but made a horrible light bulb. Uh, from there, kind of sat dormant for a while. Uh, in the mid-50s, uh, it kind of resurfaced uh, as people started to develop uh, its tensile strength and kind of rediscover that strength. Uh, by the 80s and 90s, uh, it was being researched all around the world. Uh, its fiber properties were being manipulated to be even stronger, uh, and that's where we are today. Uh, you know, people are continuing to, to push the envelope as far as what can be done with the materials, uh, how the fibers can be manipulated. Uh, so, you know, at this point, there's all types of universities, large corporations, uh, even countries that are researching the material uh, to make it suit today's needs. 
So the advantages for our industry specifically uh, for carbon fiber could be the fact that it's non-corrosive. That's extremely important because uh, specifically here in the U.S., uh, traditional building methods have been concrete and rebar. Uh, and rebar does not do well uh, in climates that have uh, either salt water or, um, you know, your climates where there's salt or brine used uh, to treat roadways. Uh, basically, the, the steel will rust, uh, corrode, expand, and it damages the concrete. Uh, so carbon fiber main advantage is that's not a concern with the material itself. Uh, it's also extremely lightweight, has an extremely high tensile strength as well, uh, especially for its weight, and it's very durable. Uh, so the elements don't get to it. Um, you know, it can take impact. It's not really designed for that, but it can take impact. Uh, and obviously it can easily be coated with other surfaces uh, to further protect it as well. So we're going to start off with some of the commercial applications uh, or civil applications, if you would, both of them together. Um, this is an extremely common repair that's done uh, with carbon fiber. So anytime that there's a bridge, um, you know, that's hit its life cycle or they're starting to experience some spalling or decay of the concrete, uh, for whatever reason, they'll do what's called confinement. Uh, so if you look at the picture on the right there, you can see uh, they basically wrapped the entire uh, column, support column for that bridge. Uh, so it could be something as simple as the bridge is experiencing heavier traffic patterns than it was originally designed for, uh, and th the load capacity needs to be increased. Uh, this would be used for this very, very commonly. Uh, so it, I always kind of attribute it to, it's very similar to wrapping your arm in a cast. Uh, you're essentially confining that column uh, to where it, it can't deflect the concrete that could be damaged below. It's now going to be confined in a way that um, you don't have to worry about any future damages. Here's a couple more examples of it with a little bit more of a description if you guys care to read it, but it's basically a synopsis of what I just said. Uh, but here's a couple of examples of actual installations. Uh, you can see columns there on the left picture. Uh, that was actually a uh, warehouse that was being repurposed. That's another very, very common uses, usage for the carbon fiber application. Uh, so where I live, there was a lot of old manufacturing facilities uh, that are now being turned into uh, residential condos or apartments. Uh, so obviously the load increase is gonna be different. Uh, so if you have point loading or anything like that, uh, the carbon fiber can be used to add additional load capacity to the floors above it or below it, uh, whatever needs to be done. Uh, so that's common, you'll see that on beams and there's actually a couple pictures of them doing it to the uh, bottom side of slabs as well to increase load capacity that way. Uh, and if you look at the picture on the right there, um, that actually has some additional uh, carbon fiber plate banding around it uh, to offer even more resistance against um, possible deflection. Uh, so that was actually a new build as you can see uh, so there's a lot of materials that are being used uh, prior to, uh, you know, heavy commercial or civil projects being utilized by traffic. Uh, and this is basically a preventative measure or a way to use uh, less building materials and, and keep the strength there. Uh, so that's going to be something that we're going to see more and more often uh, moving forward. Here's a couple of pictures of kind of what I was talking about um, as far as, you know, wrapping columns uh, to, you know, because of damage purposes or increasing load capacity. Uh, again, this is also a slab uh, as well. Uh, so what this was, was uh, a parking garage that they had uh, a change of use and basically they needed to increase the, the capacity of the, the weight that could be taken on the slab above it. Um, so they used uh, two foot wide sheets of material uh, and laminated that on site. Um, another really cool project that Johnny was involved in, he actually got to go to Mauritius Island. Uh, it's kind of similar to this and they used a combination of both of these types of repairs. Uh, so they had a shopping center where the garage caught fire um, and damaged the concrete uh, to a point of they were looking at total replacement or closing the facility completely. Uh, and with it being a small island, it was their main shopping uh, mall, so they didn't really have the option of closing it. <clears throat> so he was there for 14 days, uh, and they worked 14 days straight. Uh, it, it was, a, I think, a 20-man crew uh, installed 
you know, several thousand linear feet of carbon fiber in both of these types of applications, both column wrapping and slab install. Some things to consider that we always uh, kind of talk about anytime we get involved in a commercial or civil application um, is something we want our installers to be aware of because everybody wants, you know, the big jobs. Uh, but there's some things that you need to consider for that, uh, and we always are transparent with that. Uh, so there's always going to require um, a, a saturator for the carbon fiber itself. Uh, so if you look at those pictures at the top, you basically have a bay where the epoxy is held, uh, and essentially the carbon fiber is fed through those bars, uh, and it comes out pre-saturated. Uh, it's going to be called for on just about any commercial or civil job, and that's just to ensure proper saturation. Um, there's a lot of uh, additional documentation for employees uh, or site managers that are going to be on site. Uh, obviously, you have your PPE requirements uh, that are going to be set by OSHA, and then there's also additional training hours that have to be built in uh, for your employees as well. Um, and then some of the things, particularly to the jobs themselves, that are um, sometimes not thought about prior to going in is you're going to have slower pay cycles much higher insurance rates and liability rates. Uh, obviously the PPE uh, can cost a lot more than what a lot of guys expect. And then the, the training uh, is not just an expense, it's a huge time as well. Uh, I think Johnny just completed his OSHA 30 uh, and it's you know 30 hours of pretty intensive training. And then there's also additional stuff that goes along with that too, depending upon uh, the type of job site that you're gonna be on. So the reason that everybody is after the carbon fiber, the civil and commercial projects is it's estimated that there's a $3 billion uh, annual sales in that. Uh, moving forward, that's just gonna get worse. Uh, so the Army Corps of Engineers basically does an assessment of our infrastructure every year. Uh, and a lot of it was built post-World War II, uh, specifically the interstate system. So at this point, everything there is, you know, two thirds of the way or more through its life cycle as far as the age of the concrete. Uh, a lot of these structures were designed uh, ins insufficiently as far as, um, you know, the type of traffic patterns that they have today, the size of vehicles that are on them. Uh, so there's a ton of uh, retrofitting that needs to be done. And then there's a lot of replacements with retrofits that need to be done as well. Uh, so it's expected, you know, that there's gonna be that $3 billion annually, uh, as we continue to uh, gear up to fix these things, it, it's going to at least triple, if not quadruple, uh, annually as far as the money that's going to be invested in the carbon fiber. And that's really why there's so much research being done uh, to develop uh, these carbon fiber systems uh, to suit these needs. These are a couple other commercial projects that Johnny was involved in. Uh, the one on the left was a water silo um, that they basically were looking at doing a removal and replacement uh, and this was something that was done uh, over the course of a couple of weeks uh, very very quickly very clean um, the other examples you have here are going to be some more column strengthening beams and wall strengthening this just shows you kind of the versatility of the material itself how it can be applied uh, multiple layers, grid patterns, things of that nature. Uh, you know, the beam strengthening there, you have, you know, both flexural and uh, shear reinforcements going on there. Uh, so it really just kind of depends upon uh, what the engineer is calling for. And this is where we usually take the opportunity, guys. We have uh, full-time engineering staff. Uh, so if there's anything that comes across your table uh, that's outside of your comfort zone, or you want us to take a look at it or collaborate with your engineers that you're working with, we're more than happy to do that. Uh, that's why we have our engineering teams for exact projects like this. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you would do residentially is going to be uh, pretty straightforward and fairly repetitious. Uh, but anytime you get into a commercial application for liability purposes, things of that nature, uh, it needs to be cleared by the manufacturer and uh, your engineer that's going to be on site. And this is actually a project that I oversaw uh, during my time at the basement, guys. Um, this was an H.H. Gregg building uh, that when it was built, uh, the rebar didn't overlap in the walls. Uh, so rather than removing and replacing the wall, 
uh, or buying the building back from HH Gray because they refused to take possession. Uh, carbon fiber was utilized both on the inside and the outside uh, to defend against uh, wind shear, snow load, and this was by the loading dock, so they were worried about uh, possible impacts from trailers as well. Uh, so you know, our, our engineering team collaborated with, uh, I think it was about four or five different engineering firms that were taking a look at this thing. Uh, and there was actually multiple layers of carbon fiber uh, at varying lengths per strap location that you see there that's prepped out. So there was, uh, I believe it was a 28 foot strap initially and then it dropped down to like a 20 and then finally I think a 14 foot strap was laminated on each one of those. Uh, and they were basically on opposing four foot center uh, from the inside to the outside. So essentially what you ended up with was uh, a strap every two feet between the inside and the outside. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, carbon fiber itself, the manufacturing process, isn't considered green, but uh, how it's utilized is considered green. Uh, so for those of you that that's important, obviously in certain states it's extremely important. Uh, you can even get you know state money or federal money for being uh, green. So you know that's something to consider as well. You know rather than tearing a wall out and rebuilding and replacing it with all the new materials. Uh, you know, it can't, the, the retrofitting with the carbon fiber uh, does qualify as a green material. So some of the residential examples uh, that you could possibly be looking for, uh, it's going to kind of be uh, similar to the commercial, but it's going to be uh, different in the sense that it's going to be mainly isolated to uh, the foundations of the home. So it's going to be much smaller scale, uh, much more uh, quick to remedy the situation. Uh, but again, kind of similar. This is again an example of fall to broken concrete. That's what you would see on a bridge deck, uh, something of that nature, or a parking garage. Um, so in this case, the, the contractor that performed this installation uh, went in and removed all of the uh, unfound concrete, coated the rebar that was exposed. You can kind of see it here, um, coated it with an anti-rust uh, inhibitor, and then repaired the concrete, and then used carbon fiber to confine it. This is kind of the stages here, uh, just to kind of go through so you guys can see what's involved. That's after it's been repaired, and then this is with the carbon fiber insulation on it. Uh, so what this is doing is basically confining uh, and bonding the new uh, repair mortar to the existing foundation wall, uh, keeping that from separating, and then obviously keeping the elements from affecting it as well. Uh, once the carbon fiber is cured out, it's going to be watertight. Um, for any exterior applications, it needs to be uh, painted at least, if not coated in either a concrete product of some sort. Or a lot of uh, a lot of our customers will use an elastomeric stucco, uh, just so there's a little bit of flex and give to it. Uh, this this is an example of uh, a fracking outfit. Uh, so prior to uh, becoming a customer of ours, they would go in and frack, uh, and they're held liable for any any building that's on that uh, that site that they're going to be fracking. So they were essentially going in, doing their work, and having to replace uh, total foundations or rebuild a new foundation and move the home and set it on a new foundation. Uh, so what they started to do was prior to any fracking being done, they would go in and reinforce. Uh, so you can see even with the carbon fiber, there's still going to be some damages there just because of the nature of fracking. Uh, it basically creates little mini earthquakes below uh, below the grade there. Uh, so they, they still had repair work to do after the fact, but rather than paying for uh, you know building or rebuilding a complete foundation and resetting the home, uh, they were able to go in and do minor tuck pointing, uh, some block replacement, things of that nature. Uh, so in the end, they saved a ton of money uh, by going this route uh, and then obviously didn't have to displace the, the residents on the, the property. So a lot of you guys will know this that's already on here, but we mainly focus uh, and a lot of the industry focuses on two different types of carbon fiber. Uh, the first one is going to be unidirectional, and that refers to the way that the carbon fiber is wove. Uh, so the unidirectional is going to be all vertical or all horizontal. Um, so the, the 
unidirectional weave is going to give you strength in one direction. Uh, this is going to be what's most commonly used for beams, columns, piers, and walls. Um, just because you don't need any tensile strength in that secondary uh, axis. You can see here most of the column wrap chops that you see that we kind of previously looked at are going to be um, going to be the unidirectional material. The bidirectional is what we refer to our 90 degree weave. Uh, so you have carbon fiber that intersects on a 90 degree axis, both horizontally and vertical. Uh, so that's going to give you strength in both directions. Uh, things like stair step cracking are both wall material. We use that very commonly. Um, you know, it just kind of anywhere where you think there may be shear or slippage or uh, inward movement, that's kind of the preferred material to go just because you're defended against multiple directions of, of pressures. So that kind of wraps up the, the commercial and civil portion of it, a little bit of the background. Uh, this is going to be uh, kind of our products that are geared specifically to the residential portion of things. Um, we're going to run through pretty much the gamut of them. Uh, so with the bowed wall repair specifically, and this is what basically we've built our company on, uh, you're going to reinforce in place. You're not going to be doing anything to uh, reset the wall or push it back. Uh, but what you're doing is stopping any future inward movement. Uh, we were the first to the market and hold the patent on top and bottom connections. Uh, so that's going to link you into the sill plate the first available connection for the framing, and then the bottom connection is going to go either into the slab or the footer. Uh, and just like all of the other materials that we use, uh, it's going to be a wet lay application, meaning you're going to receive a, a raw woven fabric and it's going to be wet laid with the epoxy on site. This is what your bowed wall kit is going to look like uh, coming from us or one of our distributors of our material. You're going to have everything that you need to do three repair kits uh, and it's going to be two tubes of epoxy that's the sill plate brackets for the top connection uh, and then the carbon fiber itself one important thing to kind of note here guys is we provide the additional material uh, to make those top and bottom connections so for instance the eight foot bowed wall kit is going to measure nine foot three uh, that additional 15 inches of material is to make your top and bottom attachment that's not something uh, that you as the installer have to account for. We've already built it into the kit itself. This is what your telltale bowed wall is going to look like. You're going to have a joint that's failed. Typically, it's going to be horizontal if you're working with block. Uh, if it's poured concrete, it can kind of do whatever it wants, but you're still going to typically see uh, that horizontal crack just below the uh, soil level on the outside, right by the free stall uh, location if you're in that type of climate. Um, you know, you, you, you're going to see cracks of varying size in this joint. Uh, sometimes they'll open up an inch or two. Uh, the size of the joint doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is the amount of deflection on the wall. Uh, we limit that to two inches of movement uh, inward. So, you know, the, the most accurate way to get a reading on that is going to be a plumb bob, uh, hang it from the floor joist, scoot it over until it hits the belly of the wall and then take a measurement and figure out how far you have uh, as far as deflection goes. Uh, that is the most accurate way to figure out where you're at. Uh, you know, two inches doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but most of your residential walls are going to be uh, 8 by 16 blocks, so two inches of movement in something that narrow is actually quite significant. Uh, so you'd be surprised. You know, you look at a wall that looks fairly scary, it's, you know, maybe an inch, inch and a half out. Uh, two inches is it's quite scary when you get down into a basement that has that much movement. So our standard design spacing for the bowed wall is going to be two foot from the corner and then four foot maximum. Uh, that is a true maximum number. It can't be exceeded, uh, but it can be adjusted to where they're closer together. Uh, so in, in the case where you have you know, a window or a pilaster or some plumbing, uh, you can basically just drop your spacing down to miss that obstacle and then restart your four foot spacing after the fact. And this is included in uh, the first page of all of the instruction manuals that we send out with the bowed wall kits. So if there's ever any questions surrounding this, it's there to reference right in the instruction manual. 
So the wall prep and your joint repair are gonna be the most important part of any bowed wall installation. Uh, you're gonna grind whether it's been painted or not. Uh, it could be a brand new built home. Uh, it's never had any water run through the hollows. You're still gonna grind it. Uh, the idea is you need to get to the aggregate inside the block itself. So you're gonna remove that kind of surface layer of texture or the slurry layer to get to the actual concrete block itself. Uh, any, any caulking, uh, or any deep joints need to be uh, removed, replaced. Any failed joints have to be completely removed or replaced. Uh, this is important because if you don't have a solid joint there, um, you know, there's a chance when the soil dries out and retracts from the wall that the wall could try to relax as well. And that'll basically give you a ripple in the carbon fiber. It's not gonna cause it to fail, but it's gonna cause you to get phone calls about it. So the idea is to lock this wall in place so the joints need to be sound and solid uh, to be able to accomplish that. Um, you can kind of see here, this is the joint that actually failed. So it was totally removed, replaced with hydraulic cement. This is just an example of a joint that was, uh, you know, deeply pointed when the wall was built. Uh, so rather than grinding the block until it gets to where it's flush, uh, you can just fill it in with hydraulic cement as well. But the idea is, is you want a straight uniform uh, prep site before the carbon fiber is applied. Uh, so once you have all your grinding done, your joints repaired, you can go ahead and pre-drill your sill plate locations uh, to receive the two lag bolts and drill your three quarter inch hole right at the base of the wall. And that will be used to accept the pen for the bottom. So your sill plate bracket <coughs> application is quite simple. Uh, you're going to wet out the top six inches of carbon fiber with the epoxy and you're going to roll the bracket two complete times uh, around that carbon fiber. Uh, the only thing to really look for here uh, that can be a possible error point is the direction of the carbon fiber. Uh, it's very important that the carbon fiber is coming up to the back and then back down behind the bracket. You want this to be facing downward behind the bracket. Uh, if you were to reverse this and have the carbon fiber coming up the front of the bracket, this would basically not be in tension until the sill plate slips from the wall to catch the carbon fiber. Uh, so by having this coming behind it and running directly to the wall, you're going to be in immediate tension there. So after you have your bracket attached and you're in, uh, wet it out, go ahead and, and lag it to the sill plate. As you can kind of see here at the top, you're going to move the carbon fiber out of your way. Uh, the most common way to do it is just kind of roll it up and tuck it up into the rim joist. Uh, tie it off to the side or tape it up somewhere. Um, then you're going to start with your carbon or with the epoxy application. Uh, I, I personally usually train guys to divide the wall in half uh, as far as the epoxy application goes. This will help with the epoxy wanting to run down the wall. Um, you know, once it's in kind of strands like that, it builds a little bit of weight. It wants to run. Uh, so if you, you know, start from the top and go to the about the middle of the wall, go ahead and try that out. That'll get the epoxy evenly distributed in that area and it won't run on you. Uh, after you've accomplished that, then you would go on and repeat the process for the bottom half of the wall. Uh, you want to make sure that this is a fairly heavy application. Your base coat's gonna be the heavy one because uh, it's going to penetrate the block and soak into the fiber. Uh, so you want a uniform wet look uh, to the entire wall. Uh, one thing to check for, and this is where we get a lot of guys that, um, know, use too much epoxy, uh, is as you trowel the epoxy out, it tends to build on the outside edges of your trowel, which pushes the epoxy outside of where the carbon fiber is going to be installed. Uh, so something to look for is just kind of beads of carbon or epoxy that's sitting out there. Uh, if you see that, just kind of push it back towards the center where the strap's actually going to be installed. Uh, this will help soak the, the uh, carbon fiber itself and will result in you using less epoxy on the second coat of epoxy. If you happen to get any epoxy on the floor uh, or you have any leftover on your trowel, you can go ahead and just put that into the hole that you've pre-drilled at the base there. Uh, and then if, if you don't have anything like that, just go ahead and put, fill that bottom hole about halfway up with, with epoxy prior to uh, going any further. So after you've got your base coat, uh, everything's got a nice wet look, uh, no heavy spots, uh, no dry spots. 
Uh, you're going to go ahead and unroll that strap, uh, give it a little tug to pull it tight, uh, and then you're just going to lay it directly into uh, the epoxy that you've laid out. Uh, you want it to be as, as straight as possible. Uh, if it has little deviations, it's not going to affect anything as far as the strength goes. Uh, it's mainly for appearance purposes, for professionalism. Um, you know, you want it to be as straight as possible. Once you have it kind of bedded in where you want it to be, uh, you can go ahead and push the, the carbon fiber into the epoxy with your, your plastic putty knife. Uh, that'll kind of help, you know, get a better bond with the actual concrete surface. Uh, and at this point, you're going to work downward. Uh, with with the actual epoxy application, you want to work from the bottom up so the epoxy can build on your trowel rather than uh, going from the top down. Uh, you would essentially end up just dumping the epoxy everywhere. Uh, so for the base layer, work down to the bottom to the top. And then once you have the carbon fiber there, uh, you're going to work from the top to the bottom. And this is where we get most of our questions, uh, and it's rightfully so. This isn't something that we just put out uh, put out on our website because uh, it's kind of proprietary to our patent. Uh, the bottom attachment. Uh, so you've got your hole that's pre-drilled there at the base. Uh, you're going to need about six to eight inches of carbon fiber to create this pin on site. Uh, so you just kind of let that hang out on the floor until you're ready to do this portion. Um, but essentially, you just fold the carbon fiber behind itself. Uh, to create kind of a point or a triangle and then you twist it to the left or the right and you tuck it down into that pinhole. Uh, if the epoxy isn't level with the, with the surface of the concrete, go ahead and top it off to where it is. Uh, that'll kind of help water from, keep water from being able to come up through there uh, if, if there is any moisture in the basement. Another question we get a lot is guys struggle with being able to get this Kind of uniform appearance that's here. Uh, the only way that you can achieve that that I've found is by going on and installing a couple more straps, give the epoxy a little bit of time to pack up, and then you can manipulate this to get it to where it actually holds. Uh, so that's that's the most efficient way rather than just sitting here trying to uh, mess with it over and over and over trying to get it to hold that form. It won't. You're essentially taking six inches of material and putting it into a three quarter inch hole. Uh, so it's not going to want to hold there until the epoxy is tacked enough to, to keep that material in place. After you have everything situated, uh, you know, you're happy with your pen, your straps straight, then you're going to do your final, much lighter second coat on the outside of the fiber. Uh, and the purpose of this is to make sure that everything is properly saturated. Uh, you don't need a super thick layer of epoxy on the outside. Uh, a lot of guys like to do it, and that's fine if you do. Just be aware that you're going to use additional epoxy than what we provide in the kit itself. Uh, all you're trying to do is make sure that everything is totally uh, saturated with the epoxy at this point. So a couple of tips and tricks that I picked up from my time as managing at the basement guys as far as site management would be, um, you know, divide the processes and the procedures out amongst your crew members. Uh, we usually ran two-man crews for carbon fiber application. Uh, so basically those guys would get there, go ahead and tent everything off, plastic everything, uh, cover anything of importance. Uh, one guy would go ahead and start with the grinding uh, for the walls, and the other guy would start pre-drilling the top sill plate connections and drilling the bottom attachments. Uh, that's the most efficient way to get the prep work done. Uh, after the one crew member has done all the pre-drilling, he would go ahead and start installing the carbon fiber. Uh, this would allow the guy that was doing the grinding to be on the fourth or fifth strap location. Uh, so he would basically just keep going with the grinding while the straps were being installed. And then once he finished up grinding, uh, he would jump on and help with uh, actually hanging the carbon fiber itself. Uh, that's the fastest way. We had guys that I could send two guys out and do 20 to 30 straps in a day uh, and be home by three or four o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, that, that is the most efficient way to get it done. Um, rather than having, you know, both guys grinding and then both guys have to circle back, it's just the fastest way. Plus you get guys that are really good at both portions of it, which makes for, again, much cleaner installation uh, and less callbacks in the end. Uh, a couple of things to check for during the carbon fiber application. Uh, if you're using the bi-directional material, 
you're going to have little toes that hang out on the end. Uh, you want to make sure that those are uh, pushed down to the concrete block. If those are holding up on the edges, once the epoxy cures out, it, they're basically just super thick razor blades. Uh, they're incredibly sharp. Uh, so for the safety of the customers, just make sure that those are laying flat. Uh, you can adjust any of your bottom locations at this time if, if there's some that you're not happy with. Um, and then you can clean up all the tools in, in the job site with the tough wipes uh, that we provide as well. And those will work on your hands, on the tools, uh, job sites, you know, anything that you get it on the truck. If you have wet epoxy on there, it will remove it uh, up to the point that it cures out. These are a couple of things that we get uh, from our installers all across the country as far as adapting the installation. Uh, so occasionally you won't have a sill plate. Uh, in, that, in that scenario, you would attach directly to the rim joist. Uh, if you don't have a rim joist, then you know if it's like concrete block all the way up or it's in like a cellar or something like that, and you have a slab directly on top of the wall, uh, you would just run a horizontal strap across the length of the wall. Uh, and what that does essentially is if one strap were to get loaded up more than the ones around it, um, you know, it would basically redistribute that pressure uh, across that horizontal strap uh, and put it into the other straps directly around it. Uh, so this kind of helps prevent against any shearing that may occur at the top uh, where there is no sill plate available to connect to. Uh, another thing that we have uh, almost daily uh, are guys that run into homes that already have an, an existing interior drainage system. Uh, so the workaround for that uh, is to move it off of the wall if it's loose enough. Uh, so all you need to do is be able to get your three quarter inch drill bit behind that material uh, and you can make your bottom pin location. Uh, if it is tight to the wall, a lot of systems are, um, you need to remove a little bit of the concrete there at your strap location, pull the material away, go ahead and drill your bottom, uh, your, your bottom connection point install the strap and then put everything back uh, and re-pour the concrete. The ideal time, uh, if you're gonna be doing a drainage system, uh, we have a lot of guys that do you know, multiple different types of repairs. Uh, if you're doing a drainage system, ideally you do the strap install uh, at the same time. That way you have direct access to the footer and you don't have to come back at a later date and basically you know, disturb the, uh, the drainage system that you just put in. This is kind of just an example of your typical uh, bowed wall repair. You have your joint repaired, the, the horizontal joint that failed is removed, totally replaced. And then you have um, you know, your, your spacing here, two foot from the corners. This was an adjustment. Uh, the four foot would have been out in here. Uh, so they basically closed that, that span up there. So I think that's about a two and a half foot span. So they came tight to the window so they could basically jump over the window itself. Uh, Jim, you asked what's the warranty on the repair. So for the bowed wall application, it is a 25-year warranty on that. Uh, it previously was uh, lifetime, but there has been certain states that now require uh, a time to be defined for a lifetime. Uh, so at that point, we basically did, we followed suit with that just so we were compliant. So you're no longer really allowed to say lifetime. It has to be defined by time. And that's where 25 years is basically the maximum amount of time that you can that you can do with a warranty like that. Uh, this is an example of two products being utilized. Um, you know, this is a, a crack repair at the bottom where the wall is sheared. That's another really common issue that you'll see in homes that have been uh, in poor repair for quite some time. Uh, so essentially this bottom block is held in place by concrete and dirt. Uh, so it can't move. It's basically confined by the two materials. Uh, so what will happen is the wall will basically slip off of that bottom block. Uh, so this was used, the, the bowed wall straps were used to reinforce the wall vertically, and then the engineer called for additional reinforcements along that shear point, uh, and that's where the crack repair was utilized for that. And that kind of leads us into the next type of repair. It's going to be the carbon fiber crack repair. Uh, this material can be utilized in both block and poured concrete. Uh, that's kind of an important keynote, as well as the bowed walls uh, repairs too. Uh, the, the surface prep is gonna be identical to the bowed wall. 
uh, you're just going to be wider because the material itself is 12 inches. Uh, aggregate should be exposed. The texture needs to be re removed. Again, that's whether the wall's been painted or not. Uh, any of the joints are going to be filled. Same thing. You can kind of see from the pictures here. They did their prep work uh, and then filled everything in with the, with the mortar. This is just kind of a during application. This was actually a, a uh, body shop and mechanic shop. Uh, there have been previous attempts at repairs on this. They used some steel stirrups uh, that essentially failed. Um, so they, they used uh, the crack repair and the corner repair, which we'll cover that here in a minute. And this is a great example of what I was talking about previously. For exterior applications, they must be painted. Um, as you can see, the benefit of the carbon fiber is it almost goes away. Uh, you would essentially have to look pretty hard to find that repair. Uh, if you were just pulling into that parking lot and you didn't know it was there, chances are you probably wouldn't notice it. Uh, the idea is not to conceal it necessarily, uh, but this is essentially going to protect the carbon fiber from UV rays. Uh, you know, we have UV inhibitors built into our epoxy, but due to the fact that this is a permanent repair that's looking to reinforce for the life of the structure, we don't want to leave any uh, any possibility for something happening 50, 60 years down the road. So that's why we require everything to be painted or charged. So if the, this is where the crack repair is unique. Uh, you can essentially use it for just general reinforcement, uh, you know, for stair step cracking, uh, you know, for, for just normal cracks or that horizontal crack that appears uh, for the wall sharing, things of that nature. Uh, but a lot of our contractors use it for water control as well. Uh, so if you have a crack that's leaking, uh, you know, the crack repair can be used as a substitute for crack injections, or it can be used to uh, make a crack injection stronger and have a second line of defense against the water. Uh, so you're, you're, you've got your surface prepped here. Uh, if you're going to be using it for water purposes, you have to remove a small portion of the concrete uh, so you can run that material below the slab. Uh, so what this does essentially is reinforces the crack, uh, but once everything's cured out, the water cannot penetrate the crack repair material itself. Uh, so you're going to create a structural water diversion uh, with the carbon fiber itself. So your procedure is you basically remove a small section of the concrete just out past the edge of the footer. Uh, you're gonna put some fresh gravel in there so you have a barrier between the carbon fiber and the footer itself. That allows the water to basically be pushed down the wall and then released below the slab. Um, so there's some materials out there. Uh, I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with like the flexi span or like the rubberized coating that you see or the full shield that you see. This is basically a structural version of that. Um, a lot of guys really like it because you get the strength of the carbon fiber and then obviously it's uh, waterproof as well. So you're kind of getting two repair for the price of one. A couple of things to check for uh, when using the crack repair for water control. Uh, it's really common where I live that new homes that have poured walls kind of have this fake brick pattern that's uh, set into the form. So when they pour it, it kind of comes out with a brick pattern to it. Uh, if you see that, you need to grind kind of the texture off of that uh, and then fill in any of those fake joints with your hydraulic cement. That way you have uh, kind of a uniform plane for the carbon fiber to, to attach to. Uh, and then another thing to check for uh, is that the crack goes below the slab itself. Uh, so like this picture on the right is a great example of what the crack needs to look like. Uh, so if this crack were to stop about halfway down the wall, you could still use the carbon fiber, but you would need to inject it first. That way the water doesn't enter the wall. Um, you know, if you use the carbon fiber, you need that crack to run below the slab so that way the water can be released. If the crack stops anywhere in that wall, uh, and doesn't go below the slab, it, it's not going to work. Essentially, the water will still get inside that crack. It'll, you know, dam up against the carbon fiber. It will slow it down, um, but there'll just be too much pressure. We'll find a way to leak around it. Uh, or over time, uh, you'll basically end up with that water freezing and thawing inside of the wall, and you'll create additional cracks that will then leak outside of the carbon fiber. So just kind of keep it in mind, the crack has to go below the slab if you're using the carbon fiber on its own to control water. Next type of repair is going to be the corner repair. 
this is going to be the same material as the bowed wall kits. Uh, the prep work is the same. You're obviously just working <clears throat> horizontally. Um, so I always train guys that this is a two-man job. If you want it to be this clean, it's definitely a two-man job, if not a three-man job. Um, you know, you, you want to kind of tape off and plastic between the, the strap locations. Uh, but the, the corner repair kit is used to uh, tie an outside corner back together. Uh, so if you have a corner that's experiencing separation or cracking around the corner, uh, the corner repair is used to tie those back together. Uh, so they had some stair step cracking that was occurring just outside of this part of the corner. Uh, so they basically, uh, you know, the, the straps are 10 feet long. So you're, you're going out and grabbing five feet of this wall, five feet of that wall. So you're using the, the developmental strength of the carbon fiber itself uh, to reinforce those parts of the walls trying to pull apart or separate. Uh, again, prep work's the same as it is with the rest of our material. Grind it, get it clean, uh, get down to the aggregate. Um, you don't necessarily have to tape off between the straps. If you don't, the epoxy is going to want to run on you. It's going to be much, much uh, dirtier than this application is. Uh, if you have two guys doing the job, you would essentially want one guy to be doing uh, the epoxy application, and then one guy coming right behind him, troweling it out, getting it evenly distributed, and then laying the strap in place, and just kind of work horizontally across both parts of the wall. Uh, the installation for this, as far as the spacing goes, is gonna be determined by the height of the wall. Uh, so the kit comes with four straps in it, uh, this company actually decided to add a fifth one just because of the height of the wall. You're welcome to do that. Uh, but typically we call for four straps on anything up to a nine foot tall wall. Um, and you basically just do one high, one low, and then uh, evenly space the remaining two uh, across that height of the wall. So the crack injection isn't really a CFRP, but it is part of the system that's commonly used with those, uh, those types of repairs. Uh, we have both a polyurethane expanding foam and an injection resin. Um, you know, they can be used on wet or dry cracks, uh, but they're basically used to seal cracks through their full depth of the concrete. Uh, so you're going to be putting it under a little bit of pressure um, and filling that void the entire depth that's, that's present. Uh, so the idea here is to keep any water from being able to enter the wall, which will ultimately make its way out into the structure. Uh, the resin is going to be more for hairline cracks. Um, it's going to be much thinner than the polyurethane and it doesn't expand, uh, but it does have, um, you know, some, some pretty good tensile strength that's equal to the concrete. Uh, so you would want to use this anywhere where you have concerns of there being structural issues with it. Um, you know, our, our epoxies are all, are all solids, uh, the polyurethane as well. Uh, it's pretty common that one one component of a polyurethane will just be water. Uh, ours is not, and it does cure solid. Um, so it does a great job of uh, filling any voids. Uh, you know, it's highly expansive. I think about 12 to 14 times its rate or its volume is what it expands. Uh, so if there's any erosion concerns or anything like that, you would use the polyurethane just so you could fill those voids. The process is pretty simple. Uh, you're gonna start out by taking a wire brush or your grinder uh, to the crack itself, making sure that there's no loose material. Um, and then once you have that accomplished, you're just gonna go ahead and set your ports with a high strength piece about every foot, uh, working your way up the entire length of that crack. Uh, and then you're gonna use the same epoxy that you set the ports with to cover the surface of the crack. Uh, this is what's gonna be the retention part of the, of the injection system. So it's basically gonna hold that material below the surface uh, so it can travel inside of the wall. Um, you know, once everything's cured out, uh, then you can start your injection process uh, and you start from the bottom, inject it until you see the material come out of the port located above it. Uh, you'll cap it off with the provided cap and then go ahead and reinsert your epoxy into that, that port location and just kind of work your way up the wall like a ladder. Um, the only question we really get surrounding this application is how soon can I inject? Uh, and the answer to that is as soon as the surface, this gray surface epoxy here is hard enough that you can't dent it with your finger or a screwdriver, 
uh, and it's going to be determined by you know all sorts of things you know temperature in the environment the uh, humidity levels moisture levels all of those things are going to have a play in how fast this material cures out uh, so there's no definitive answer that i can give you uh, it's just you know kind of do the, the the dent test if you would and and once it's cured enough to where you don't leave an impression in that epoxy uh, at that point you're free to go ahead and inject Again, a couple things to look for with the injection system. If you have that faux brick pattern that we previously discussed, you're gonna have to uh, essentially get rid of that texture. Uh, you're gonna have to do a little bit of grinding for this application. Uh, and then where those fake joint lines are, you're gonna have to kind of build the surface epoxy up. Uh, that way you have a nice tight bond with that. If you don't do that, essentially the epoxy will kind of find its way to those, those lower voids there. Uh, and it'll make its way out through there. A um, couple other things is make sure that your final injection port is located below the outside grade. Uh, there's no need to fill above that point. Uh, if there are any cracks on the outside of the wall, you can simply fill that with the, the surface of the epoxy or hydraulics and that something of that nature. But you just need to fill to the point where the grade line is. All right, I believe our final product that we're going to talk about is going to be the concrete crack lock. Um, it's a pure carbon fiber application. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with, you know, carbon fiber staples or, or bent rebar, things of that nature. Um, you know, we still do manufacture the carbon fiber staples uh, and the crack lock is essentially kind of an evolution of that. Uh, the advantage is it gives you a mechanical bond uh, with the hoops on either end uh, and the install time is much faster than a lot of other products on the market. Um, so your general install guidelines are gonna be uh, crack locks are going to be installed every 8 to 12 inches across that crack. Uh, you're always going to keep them perpendicular to the crack itself. Uh, and you're going to need to cut about an inch deep. Um, the, the crack lock itself is going to be about a half inch tall. Uh, and you want to get, uh, you know, an epoxy bed above and below that. Um, so that's kind of the real brief version of it. And it's really not much more complicated than that itself. Uh, crack locks are only for poured concrete. Uh, they would not be utilized in block walls, but they can be used in anything poured. Uh, so this could go all the way through the civil and commercial application, you know, down to residential driveways, basement floors, basement walls, uh, swimming pools if they have them, the, the pool deck itself. It doesn't really matter if it's poured concrete and it's cracked. You can use the crack locks to tie everything back together. So we really pride ourselves on uh, kind of the pre-preg construction of this. So pre-preg refers to uh, the carbon fiber being pre-cured. Uh, so these are gonna be semi-rigid. Uh, obviously they can flex, but it's not an application where you have to make it on site. It's not gonna be wet laid. Um, you know, it's gonna be pre-cured out. Uh, our tolerances are extremely tight on these. Uh, to make the cut, uh, they have to be the identical size. Uh, we test them constantly. They have to meet certain, uh, you know, each batch that's made uh, has to be pool tested uh, and confirmed to hit the tensile strengths before we ship them. Um, you know, so that allows our installers to go out and fully prep the site as far as the crack lock locations. Uh, so we've had guys that have gone out and prepped 500 crack lock locations before they even received the material. Um, you know, th these examples here are going to be slab on grade in a residence. Um, so these were basically the, the slabs are moving around and we're transcribing into the hardwood floor that was just simply glued to the concrete itself. Uh, so every time it moved, the floors would buckle. Uh, so what they did here is a combination of locking control joints together and just general cracks that had developed in the slab itself. Uh, so that's just one example of how to utilize them. Finally, guys, we always discuss our marketing. Um, you know, we, we work closely with a lot of our customers uh, to kind of help them grow their business and, and kind of take some of the things off of their plates that they don't necessarily have time to do. Uh, so we provide, you know, animated presentations, uh, sales presentations, things of that nature to kind of help you guys. A lot of our customers will download our presentations to an iPad and use that to kind of progress them through the sales portion of carbon fiber applications uh, when they do an inspection for carbon fiber. Uh, we also have the printed sell sheets that you can leave uh, with your customers. So that way, once you're not there, uh, they can kind of research you and our products on their own time. Uh, and that they can kind of use that as a guide 
uh, to help them discover uh, what the products are truly capable of. Uh, case studies are something that we do uh, quite often and we rely purely upon our contractor network to do that. Um, so, you know, we always tell our installers if you guys come across a, a unique install or just a, an installation that you're really proud of, uh, shoot us some pictures and some information. We'll, we'll post those on our Facebook and our LinkedIn and, and you know, sometimes even use them for, uh, you know, written uh, case studies to, to use as kind of a sales sheet or just a general education sales sheet. Um, so that's something that we really are, are pushing. A lot of our contractors have discovered that social media is extremely important. Uh, so anything that they can use to uh, get their work out there uh, is, is a huge benefit. Uh, so any, any home shows that uh, any of you would be doing, uh, we provide pull-up banners, uh, sales sheets, uh, things of that nature so that way you can educate your customers uh, and you know obviously you don't have the expense of uh, going out and sourcing those things yourself we provide those at no charge uh, we have all sorts of videos on our youtube page a lot of them are linked on our website as well so if you guys ever have questions as far as installation goes or your customers have uh, you know are questioning how strong the material really is we have all kinds of cool videos that kind of show off uh, those types of things uh, and then last thing, we've recently redone our website. Uh, so all of our information as far as safety data, technical data, and the instructions for application are all located on the front side of the website. Uh, previously, you had to have a contractor log in to see that. Now it's all just front and center. So if you go in and you look at the different types of repairs, uh, all the pertinent information is right there with it.